Well, Victor, I can't thank you enough for being so spontaneous and jumping on board and tackling this uh, kind of like thorny issue uh, with us today, which is genetics, aging, and COVID-19. Um, I know that you've done some really interesting uh, related research, and uh, you propose a few people that I think are really splendid in, in those areas that will join for future meetings. So I'm hoping that we can uh, tackle that issue uh, a few uh, that, that is about, like have future breakout rooms uh, also focusing on this. But for now, I'm super, super intrigued for your uh, introduction on this topic. And then we open it for good conversation. Uh, and yeah, I'll post more info about you in the chat. All right. Wonderful. Uh, Alison, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, as you said, this was a, a little bit of a, a spontaneous thing, but I'm very happy that I get the opportunity to spend some time uh, with you guys. Um, uh, for this session, I thought that uh, it would be interesting to bring three uh, seemingly different topics together. One is you know, that of genetics, human genetics in particular, COVID-19 that has been affecting us for a while already, and, and aging that, that is uh, kind of the, con the common subject that we're all interested in. Uh, and perhaps some of the data that I will be discussing here um, may be known by many of you, but I thought it would be st still nevertheless very interesting to, uh, to share. Um, so with that in mind, let me start by sharing my screen because I put together a small presentation that I think could be very useful for us to guide the conversation. Uh, and of course, if you feel like there's any question during the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. This is not a, uh, a formal presentation of any kind. This is just a discussion that I, I think we're all very excited to have. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm going to be talking about genetics, aging, and COVID-19. And as Alison mentioned, I am a, 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 an entrepreneur in residence at Apollo Health Ventures, and I've been uh, working there for a couple of years already. Uh, before I start with the subject, I wanted to give everybody a little bit of uh, a historic context. And this graph very neatly summarizes human genetics and the progress that we have done over the last uh, 26 years, or almost 30 years. Um, just for context, the Human Genetics, uh, the Human Genome Project was started in, the in 1990, and it was only finished in 2003. However, the first draft of the Human Genome, and you might be able to see this uh, on the, with the laser, uh, laser pointer, uh, the first draft was released in the year 2000. And this was a game changer for uh, um, the study of biology and humans because this allowed us to uh, first start elucidating what are the genetic causes for rare uh, genetic diseases. And of course, um, the ones that were more accessible or easier for us to understand were those that were caused by a singular mutation. These are called monogenic, rare monogenic diseases. However, with the advance of uh, the sequencing technology and the uh, introduction of next generation sequencing in 2005, these already allowed us to have a deeper look at not only many other rare genetic disorders, but also start analyzing uh, common diseases that could be caused not only by one, but multiple genetic mutations. And this is when, for example, gene-wide association studies were established. Um, just for clarification, those gene-wide association studies, what they do is they look at different populations, those could be humans, and they look for uh, linkages between phenotypes, be that a particular disease or even longevity, and a specific uh, genetic, genetic regions of the genome. Um, and so with this information in mind, um, and taking into account that we have understood some of these rare genetic disorders for a longer time, it is not surprising that these are um, the diseases that many of the gene therapy and gene editing companies that are nowadays leading the way in terms of treatments for these rare diseases are focusing on specifically those that we, uh, the ones that we understand best, right? These rare monogenic disorders that are caused by a singular mutation and we know that with uh, either a gene therapy or a particular gene editing, this would make a, a, a huge difference and it would be able to rescue those disease phenotypes. Some of these diseases include, uh, for example, sickle cell disease. Uh, this includes hemophilia. This includes uh, some form, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and many others. However, as you guys probably already know, the idea and the goal is in the long term to be able to tackle those more common diseases that are caused by 
a multitude of mutations or variations within genomes or within genes and genomic regions. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to give you an example of what this looks like and why genetics, human genetics is so relevant. PCSK9 was this, it's a gene that was discovered in 2003. This gene uh, was discovered in a couple of families in France that had a gain of function mutation. And what they observed is that these families had an accumulation of LDL cholesterol, also known as the bad cholesterol. And um, because of this, um, uh, scientists hypothesized that this gene was fundamental not only for the accumulation of this bad cholesterol, but perhaps if you were to look for not gain of function, but loss of function mutation within the human population, this would be a great indication that this could be a gene, uh, um, attractive, an attractive target for the treatment of cardiovascular conditions that are associated with this high bad cholesterol. And so it was soon after in 2006 that uh, the first reports um, looking at uh, or, or describing loss of function uh, mutations in the gene PCSK9 uh, came about. And not only they described that these people were having lower uh, LDL uh, cholesterol, but also they were not reporting any secondary detrimental effects, which is a very, very encouraging uh, site. And this um, encouraged scientists to uh, further try to develop ways to uh, downregulate this gene, right? And the uh, let's say most targeted approach that uh, we had at the moment was the development of monoclonal antibodies. And so in 2009, we had already the development of the first uh, reduction of uh, LDSC by tackling uh, PCSK9 through monoclonal antibodies. And by 2012, we had already the first phase one uh, human clinical trial. Of course, shortly after, in 2015, we had already two uh, um, monoclonal antibodies tackling uh, this gene uh, approved by both the FDA and EMA in Europe. And um, this short time span of, uh, as you can see, pretty much 12 years allowed us to go from the discovery of the function of a gene, the association of its, func of its function in humans, and the development of a very, very uh, effective therapeutic. However, this doesn't stay here. This is not the end of that uh, PCSK9 story because um, shortly after, actually in 2018, a company called Birth Therapeutics was founded. And the idea of Birth Therapeutics was to, um, or is to use base editing technologies to introduce those loss of function mutations within the PCSK9 gene in order to reduce systemically the LDL cholesterol of people that have high tendency, uh, high propensity for the accumulation and therefore reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So in the long-term vision of VERF is actually a preventative approach, not so much as a treatment approach. Um, and so in their words, they're trying to develop a, a vaccine against heart failure in the future, which is a very, very exciting uh, approach to take. And it shows how human genetics can also help us make that transition from treating diseases into preventing diseases. Uh, of course, there's still a lot of work to be done and uh, we need to validate that it's actually working. However, they recently published uh, some data uh, suggest, uh, showing that the base editing actually works perfectly well in non-human primates to reduce LDL cholesterol. And so they will be starting a human a phase one clinical trial, phase one, phase two probably uh, in the not so distant future. Now, to put this a little bit in context, um, we are in the midst of a pandemic. And as you are probably painfully aware, this is not uh, ending anytime soon. Um, the, case, the cases continue to raise, even though the situation is a little bit more on, under control in, in certain countries, uh, this is gonna stay with us for a long time. And so the interesting part for researchers is that this is a biological mystery and the whole world is watching. And so the whole world, in my, from my perspective, and I think um, from a post perspective as well, is very much um, perhaps inclined to uh, listen to what science and what scientists can do in order to tackle not only this pandemic, 
but also other pandemics, epidemics that we may have in the future. And that may include diseases that we're already uh, suffering from. And this could include diabetes, this could include obesity, and of course, very interesting for us, what we consider aging. And so why is this a mystery? Because we have, um, or when the pandemic started, we had very little understanding of the biology of, uh, of um, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? So, and so researchers and uh, people alike have been asking themselves, why is it that some people react much worse to uh, the COVID-19 infection than others? And one of the angles that scientists decided to take to try to tackle this question was uh, looking at human genetics. However, before I get into the human genetics and connected to the uh, um, introduction of the talk, I wanted to highlight something that you are also very much aware of. And that is that one of the greatest risk factors for the, uh, uh, let's say, um, worsening of the symptoms of uh, COVID-19 is age. The older you are, the more likely you are to develop uh, uh, these um, symptoms whether this is a factor of age or the fact that as we age, become, uh, we become more uh, susceptible to other diseases and this would make us in turn more susceptible to infection as a, a completely different conversation. But uh, the point is that the older we are, the more likely we are to uh, develop symptoms if we get a coronavirus infection. And so as I was saying before, one of the tools and one of the angles that scientists have been trying to tackle uh, or, or trying to use to better understand COVID-19 has been human genetics. And so it was very exciting. For example, uh, I think it was in the month of May, if I remember correctly, there, were some, there was a study coming out of um, China that was trying to link or was trying to see whether there was an association between the particular blood type of a person and how likely they were to develop uh, uh, either uh, contract COVID-19 or to show uh, a negative uh, phenotypes associated with it. And they saw that apparently in their study, there was a reduction in the propensity to contract COVID-19 for those people that had, uh, that were a type O um, for the blood. In contrast, the people that had either A, B or AB had a slightly increased uh, propensity to develop this uh, uh, or to uh, contract this con uh, the condition. Uh, however, as I said, this is an ongoing mystery. And uh, not, not too long ago, research from Harvard actually uh, found some evidence against this strong connection in the blood um, based on the type. However, they did find some connection between the uh, Rh positive and Rh negative um, factors. Nevertheless, this is just an example of how scientists are readily and uh, rapidly using the power of human genetics, and then the fact that we're having so many cases to try to elucidate the biology behind that. Based on this, of course, um, scientists have started an initiative called the COVID-19 Host Genetics Initiative. Um, this started in March, and they have been look, looking at different human populations throughout the world that have been affected by COVID and try to understand whether there are any genetic factors that can be associated to, uh, to the disease to either repurpose re re drugs or um, to understand whether specific mutations can be protective or, uh, or, or the opposite um, against this infection. And using this approach, actually uh, scientists have uh, um, identified that there's a cluster of genes very much associated with um, the immune system that seem to be um, very much regulating or modulating how propense or how likely you are to develop negative symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, this is perhaps not surprising. However, it's a, it's a, a, a very interesting step that is going to allow us to better understand how the disease is working. And of course, there are many different angles that are going to help us to better understand the disease. However, this is a very, very valid approach. Now, why do we think or why do I think that human genetics, COVID-19, and this context can also be relevant uh, for us in order to uh, better understand aging and better tackle aging. Well, as you guys are very well aware, the uh, mouse genome, for example, has around 25,000 uh, 25, total genes. And out of them, around 136 are able to modulate aging in one way or another. Interestingly for us, there are certain pathways that seems to be very well conserved between different model organisms, and this includes uh, worms, flies, 
uh, monkeys and mice that modulate lifespan and health. And that is, of course, the nutri nutrient signaling pathways. Um, so, for example, we know that genetic interventions that reduce insulin signaling are able to extend health and lifespan in mice and other model organisms. And so these examples that I have here are specifically from mice, where we know that mutations within the insulin receptor, the insulin receptor substrate, uh, or the insulin, insulin-like growth factor one, are able to extend lifespan significantly compared to their controls. Not only that, we also know that other uh, interventions, such as dietary restriction or intermittent fasting, that also modulate that nutrient sensing network, are able to extend health and lifespan. And so these nutrients, uh, nutrient signaling can be summarized or simplified uh, in this particular graph that you can see here. And you can see we have uh, wind signaling, insulin signaling, AMPK signaling, and MAP kinase signaling. Two very famous uh, drugs, right? Metformin and rapamycin, and uh, are um, highlighted here as being fundamental to modulate or, or being important to modulate those pathways and therefore being able to also have a beneficial effect in terms of health and lifespan. Um, this representation only uh, highlights how relevant specific pathways, or in the case of FOX1 and MTOR, specific genes uh, have been uh, to um, highlight how, these, how, how important these pathways and genes have been uh, de determined to be for the modulation of longevity, right? So we have a lot of evidence for, for model organisms. However, the question is, of course, what about humans? Well, it turns out that, for example, in the case of FOXO, we know that there are more than 40 FOXO genetic variants that are associated with a reduction in mortality or an increased human health. And that could be in the form of reduction of uh, cancer um, incidence, could be a reduction in, in um, bone, uh, bone frailty uh, uh, and others. However, the, the point that I wanted to highlight here, and it's also something that I uh, get very excited about, is the fact that the studies looking at FOXO have been conducted in populations across the globe. This includes the US, this includes many European countries, China and Japan, and the results have been relatively consistent. What does this mean? It means that these variants that are different between each other may have a common underlying mechanism that would confer these protective advantages in those different populations. And therefore, would also be uh, background independent. Right? However, of course, FOXU is not alone in that. Perhaps one of the most um, uh, famous genes to uh, modulate uh, aging in humans is APOE. Right? We know that uh, APOE2 and APOE4 are uh, very um, determinant on the likelihood that one person will develop uh, dementia or not. And this in turn has a huge effect in lifespan. However, uh, by now scientists have been looking at multiple uh, populations, be that long-lived populations per se, or uh, long-lived parents and their progeny. And they have found uh, a number of proteins and genes associated with the extension of longevity and health. And this includes not only the list that I have here, but also this one right here. It's not uh, too relevant for our discussion, I think, to focus too much in one particular gene. I think it's just very relevant for us to understand that the power of human genetics is actually uh, pointing us in the direction that could be very relevant for the development of um, novel therapeutics for the treatment of aging. And so I wanted to highlight this study that actually came out a couple of weeks ago um, that you might have seen uh, advertised in... in um, scientific um, diffusion uh, web pages um, where they were analyzing or they analyzed more than a million people um, and tried to look at genetic links between their longevity and um, their biology. And they found not only some common factors such as APOE or FOXO um, or LPA, but they also found a very strong link and with a novel cluster of genes that seem to be modulated or seem to be relevant for the modulation of iron metabolism. Why is this interesting? Well, the, the authors of the paper argued that iron is a um, factor that if um, is present in blood in, at high quantities, this can make a person more propensed for the development of an infection of any kind. And this 
actually goes hand in hand with the fact that as we get older, we become more propensed to the development of infection, right? However, there's an alternative um, and perhaps non-mutual exclusive explanation. And it's the fact that, um, for example, a researcher called Manuel Serrano in Barcelona has been doing some very interesting work between the link of iron and its role as a potential inducer, uh, inducer of um, senescence. And this in turn as a potential inducer of uh, fibrosis in different tissues. So as you can see, there are many different links within these human genetic studies and uh, uh, these genes that have been identified that are in a way helping us, if not validate, at least reinforce the idea that these genes that we have been discovering and uncovering in uh, model organisms are going to be potentially relevant for humans, right? And so just to end uh, a little bit with the perspective that was given in our recent review, um, in order for uh, us to treat aging, of course, we can continue looking at um, model organisms and the genes and the pathways that are gonna be identified in those. However, I think it would be very important to um, also try to get the most out of human genetic studies that are, as, as I said, trying to point us in the right direction that have already some, let's say, real life evidence that this actually works in humans, right? If we were to identify gain of function or loss of function mutations of particular genes that have um, um, relevance in the modulation of aging and health, then this could also be a very, very elegant approach for us to target those genes and therefore develop a, a fast uh, a therapeutic or fast therapy to uh, um, counteract the negative effects that we all suffer as we get older, right? Um, and so this brings me a little bit to the kind of counterpart uh, of that initial uh, um, example with the uh, cardiovascular disease and, and cholesterol gene, right? And I would like then with this, not only thank you for your attention, but open the discussion for I, you know, to hear you, your thoughts on this and whether you were aware of this kind of evidence before or whether you think this has some uh, limitations that I'm not highlighting here. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, I'm gonna, da, 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 let's see. Uh, let's see if I can unshare your screen. I can stop it. Oh, you, you just did it, okay, great, yeah. awesome. All right, well, are there any questions from anyone uh, who's on board right now? I think I saw uh, a clap from Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> a I clever like me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, are there any questions from anyone who's uh, on here? Any questions of understanding? I or, wouldn't or any, say, Yeah, go for it. I wouldn't say question. Hey, Victor. <laughs> Hi, Nicola. <laughs> but I actually looked at I like this um, gene for hemochromatosis and yes. then athletic performance because um, better absorption of iron seems to help with endurance. Um, and then also some health complications that athletes have after their career ends, which I was thinking that maybe even could be linked to excess iron. Um, so I think it's a super interesting thing to look at for longevity. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed the study when it was published, it, it's super exciting. Yeah, I agree. A very, very exciting study. I was not aware of the of, of that uh, problem with the, the athletes and their performance. They even in their... would use it as doping. <laughs> in, um, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, it, uh, well, uh, I'll send you some links for it. I looked at it years ago. So maybe it's been updated or uh, unvalidated, but I'll, I'll send you some stuff. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question. Um, have you uh, tried differentiating the possible space of genetic interventions um, into these two buckets where there's like cell intrinsic and cell non-intrinsic effects? Um, the reason I ask is that if um, like the current state of, of gene therapy uh, is that uh, the efficiency is low, so only a small fraction of the cells um, can actually be transfected. Um, sorry about my noise. Um, and so if, if, if there's some effect, like for instance, if there's a, a gain of function mutation that's beneficial and that's non, 
cell, cell intrinsic or cell autonomous, um, then you know the cells that are transfected can then secrete that factor to the rest of the body or the rest of an organ and create a positive effect. But if they're cell intrinsic effects, um, then you essentially have to efficiently um, tr uh, like genetically modify every single cell um, that you want not to age. And so it doesn't really do, it, do any good if, if only 0.1% of my cells um, are aging more slowly and the other 99% of me is aging at the full rate. Um, doesn't solve my problem. Um, so ha have you thought about that as a, as a factor for differentiating? So that, that is a great question. I, I, I have not thought about that personally. Full disclosure, I'm not a human geneticist. This is just something that I'm very uh, passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, I, I, I would have to disagree with the point you made that, that gene therapies and, and gene editing therapies are necessarily uh, inefficient at the moment. So it is true that right now there might be some limitations that I am, but I am absolutely certain that technology is going to help us overcome those. And uh, to the second point, meaning that you would need the majority of your cells to be um, edited or, or transfected in one way or another to have or to reap the beneficial effects. I think this really depends on uh, how detrimental the effects that you're seeing are actually going to be uh, affecting you. So I'll give you an example. Recently, uh, actually, the, the last conference that I was able to attend before COVID was in San Francisco, and this was looking at gene therapies and gene editing. And uh, uh, David Liu uh, was giving a talk there, and he uh, showed some data, very interesting data, where they have been working with progeria mice. Right? These progeria mice have a mutation in their uh, nuclear lamina, and this mutation causes them to have a, a super accelerated aging-like phenotype. Yeah. He demonstrated that, at least in the mice that they had, by modifying something like, I think it was 20% of the cells of the heart, these mice were already having a lifespan extension of more than threefold, right? So, of course, you know, if you're treating a healthy human being and you're trying to uh, prevent a, 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 a disease that is going to have a very minor effect, but it's still going to shorten the lifespan, then yes, you would likely need to modify most of their, uh, the cells. However, if the effect that you're going to be trying to tackle is actually big, you won't need to uh, um, uh, modify all the cells or treat all the cells. Mm -hmm. If you do that with a small fraction, I think this should suffice. Perhaps one little quote or an extra um, nudget of, uh, of, thing, uh, of science there and is that it also really depends what kind of tissue you're targeting because if you're targeting a tissue that is highly uh, uh, mitotic then of course you're gonna have a you might have a problem however if you're uh, targeting post mitotic tissues like the heart like the brain you again will not necessarily have a problem the transfection efficiency is low because these cells are always going to be there and they're probably going to be able to, uh, uh, to some extent, compensate for those negative effects. Okay. Um, huh. Thanks. I mean, I know that in some tissues, uh, like for instance, liver, it's really easy to, to like pretty much hit every single cell. Exactly. exactly. Um, With the current technology, yes. And that's actually one of the reasons why VERB is going after uh, um, this gene because that particular gene uh, is expressed in the in the liver mm -hmm. and uh, affects the cholesterol levels overall and that's why it has the effects negative effects in the heart so the reason that you introduced this notion of of uh like still proliferating versus post mitotic uh tissue types um is that you have um you have uh, a, a wider time window to access those cells to genetically modify them? Or like, what's the, what's the effect of, of the mitosis process? The effect would be that, for example, if you are delivering a, um, let's say a gene therapy, mm -hmm. these, these plasmid could be diluted down or could be destroyed as the tissue divides and the, the cells regenerate, uh, regenerate right. themselves. So it depends on whether you're talking integrative or non-integrative. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's why I, I, that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Got it. yeah. I mean, I think there's also a benefit in a, 
in our mycotic cell and that like you think of the first gene therapies ever were basically on hematopoietic stem cells and that's because they could effectively the corrected ones will outcompete the non-corrected ones so you get like selective in vivo proliferation of them so i mean mm -hmm. although the tools you need are different for each i i don't really think there's a strong bias for one or the other in terms of which are easier to go after i mean the I mean, one the, main, the laminin thing made me think of the disease epidermolosis bullosa, and you know, it's the thought that if you can get five percent of the the collagen seven, you will cure that disease. Um, so you you don't have to hit all of them um, because although this kind of toes the line between a cell intrinsic and a cell extrinsic yes. thing, which I think really is at the heart of this kind of a, <laughs> how you slice and dice this, and it mm -hmm. it it is more or less still an external factor it's just a local one as opposed to like say idua or something for mps1 which is truly systemic and uh but also secreted by effectively every so cell yeah. like uh, the notion of paracrine in terms of uh yeah. yeah i'd say it is like devilishly hard to find a cell you can modify that doesn't affect another cell <laughs> so the uh it, it, in a sense it there may not be anything that's truly intrinsic short of maybe DNA repair. Um, those, those are the ones that come to mind. I'm, I'm sure there's others actually, but, uh, but for most of these diseases, uh, a cell can affect its neighbors and, uh, for, for better or worse. And that's why like when we started going after, uh, you know, MPS on with my last company, it was on this idea that even though every cell needs it and typically every cell makes it, uh, they have the ability to take it up, even if it's not naturally done, they, they still will, take it up if you decorate it properly with the post translation. Mm. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Comments, questions? I, I've okay. got a, a question yeah. for Victor. Like what what's uh if you could target anything today, uh you know, technology be damned, like what uh what do you think would be the most attractive target? If you if you could uh play God with one gene um, <laughs> across the with population. With one gene? Yeah, or you, I guess you could choose a constellation, but you, other than just saying, I want to change everything in your chart, like the... To be honest, process, at least. yeah, to be honest, I think, I think the one to go right at the moment is, is APOE. The, the, the effects are so massive and so clear, and it, it makes absolute sense to try to modify that. It's also, you know, as I said, this is also a, a non-dividing tissue, the brain, you could try to do gene-based editing uh, in that regard. So I would, I would absolutely go for APOE. Thanks. No problem. Would you go, would you agree? Would you go for the same? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, there's a, I, I've been wrestling with this because uh, I mean, I spend most of my life building new hammers uh, and then I look for things to swing at them. So I, I am frequently <laughs> approaching this from the tech, <laughs> from the technology point of view, like uh, I want a new tool. And then I, uh, we always start with something that we kind of think the FDA will let us get away with. Um, but uh, then it, um, it, then the question of, well, what would you do if that wasn't a constraint is a, it's definitely an interesting one. And I guess with APOE, I've kind of gone round and round and I, you know, honestly don't understand the biology well enough, but it, you know, in terms of, would it make more sense to introduce something that just enzymatically breaks it down in the local area? Like, cause then you don't need to modify nearly as much. Um, you could, in, unlike things like antibodies, which are relatively crude tools and yeah. rely on secondary clearance mechanisms, you could just enzymatically chop that little bugger up pretty easily if, uh, or, or remove one piece of it uh, with very high specificity. Um, and then you just need to modify the, the tiniest amount of cells uh, in the area to get rid of them. But uh, so I, I don't know if, if I was going to use a genetic tool, if that's the tool I would use. Like, cause, uh, or I might use it for delivery in, in the sense of just making it constantly. But uh, yeah. do you is fixing it actually the end goal or is simply mitigating it uh, good enough? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that always uh, brings me to channel my inner Carl Flager, uh, who is always reminding us uh, at the end of this to kind of bring it back to COVID-19 and uh, how we can use the current uh, crisis and uh, you know different teams gearing up about securing different uh, types of funding sources uh, in response to the crisis to push for a uh, good research on this like Victor what would you like to see uh, done in that field and do you think that there's any openings right now with COVID-19 that uh, are useful to pursue? 
Well, to be honest, I, so uh, as I told you before, unfortunately, uh, a friend of mine that is actually the author of this uh, um, Iron um, paper, he couldn't join us today, but uh, I think they are already doing a great job trying to look at the genetics of uh, aging uh, uh, in, in humans, in not only in long-lived populations, but in humans in general. I would imagine that COVID-19 not only will be, but if, it, if not, it should be a catalyst for not only us, but also uh, uh, people that are not necessarily deeply involved in science to argue for further uh, um, funding for the development of not only treatments, but preventative uh, uh, approaches to different diseases and the biggest one of them, you know, aging. So I think that will be my, my point. But honestly, I don't see a, a clear opening at the moment besides the fact that I think we would all be able to justify aging um, related companies by just showing that but in, risk in graph for genetics, associated. And for genetics in particular, do you have a, a hinge? The thing is... The thing is that, so genetic studies are limited by the number of people that you're uh, uh, looking at and uh, by the technology that you're using, right? So you can either use a whole um, genome-wide association studies if you want to pick up relatively common uh, genetic variants or uh, use something like uh, whole exome uh, sequencing to try to pick up those more rare and more specific variants. And so if we were to have access to, for example, the genetic data of all the people that are going to be working as controls in, in, in the cases of uh, genetic um, COVID uh, cases and be able to follow them up throughout their life and better understand their, uh, their lifestyle and better understand whether their parents were long lived. You know, having that amount of numbers, I think that would be very, very powerful for us to uh, identify novel, potentially novel targets. All right, thank you. Well, I'm hoping that we get yours to come to the next meeting. And I, I, I think that he was one of the authors of, uh, of the study that you cited. So that would be right. exciting. Um, maybe he can give us a five minute update on, some, on something and specifically uh, on the study itself. Okay, great.